uh, the focus for the month of January has been primarily on prayer. And uh, of course, most of this has had to do with things that we may talk to God about. This morning, I would like us to think about what God may talk to us about. How does he communicate with us? Or in John, the 10th chapter, when uh, it gives us this information. It said, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Long before we had GPS systems in our cars or available on our phones, we have to use things like maps. Does anybody remember like AAA and the maps of, and, and the triptychs and all that? And, and so uh, back in the day, when our family would go on a vacation, my wife was the official navigator. And she has a great love and fondness for maps and a great scanner of information. And so she would have all the information we needed to get from point A to point B. Even when we did a vacation with another family and we went three weeks out west and saw seven national parks in seven different uh, states, uh, she was the navigator for both of our vehicles. And we would talk to each other th with walkie-talkies because uh, back then you had to pay extra for those minutes. And, and so uh, we would talk about, and, and they would say things like, uh, a rest stop, we need to find a restroom. And, and my wife would radio them and say, we want to head in 14 miles on the right-hand side and the building will be pink. And they go, how do you know that? How do you know that? Well, my wife has felt like she's been a little bit displaced. Now there are other voices that speak through our speakers and our phones and tell us where to go. And recently we were doing a trip across New York State and she pulled out her smart device and figured that there was actually a shorter route. It would save time and numbers of miles. And so she made a recommendation that I no longer listen to the pleasant lady in the car and listen to my pleasant wife instead. And um, uh, I did not choose wisely. Uh, <laughs> I actually chose the car. And uh, uh, my, my wife just... What we realized is it was a bad choice along the way. On the way home, I listened to my wife. Um, does God actually guide us? With all the voices that we hear making all the rec recommendations that they make, does God actually guide us? And the answer is that he desires to. What Jesus reveals is that even when he speaks plainly to us, we don't always hear him. Or when we hear him, we don't always believe him. And so uh, I'd like to first address just a couple of myths about following the guidance of God. And then I'd like to talk for a few minutes on different ways that God may choose to guide us. By the way, neither of these lists are exhaustive. It's just kind of like the top uh, three to five. The first myth is this, is if you follow God's guidance, you will never have problems. If you just follow his guidance... You will never have problems. The idea here basically is, is if you just listen to what he says, he'll always lead you on the path that's easiest, freest of all complication, no difficulty, everything will go smoothly. Well, I'd like us to realize that, first of all, Scripture doesn't tell us that. A lot of people assume they don't hear God's voice because life is not easy for them, and that is not the determining factor. For example, when you look in John the 8th chapter, it says, Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, he's not talking about rising in popularity. He's talking about being put up on a cross. He said, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, 
but just what the Father has taught me. So he's completely obedient to the guidance of his Father. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. There is a guy who not only clearly hears his Father, but always obeys it. So how did it go for Jesus? It was always easy, right? That whole thing about the cross? Oh, yeah. He was falsely accused, convicted on false testimony, sentenced to death, and an excruciatingly painful death at that. Well, that was Jesus, though, and, and he was there for our salvation. So for other people, life is easier. Well, how about the Apostle Paul? He was a guy known to be pretty obedient to God. Let's look at what he has to say. He says, are they servants of Christ? And in this passage, he's actually defending himself, and he feels embarrassed about it. So he says, I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder. Been in, what's the next word? Prison more. By the way, he wasn't just visiting prisoners. He had been arrested. Been in prison more frequently. Been flogged more severely. Been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often and gone without food. I have been cold and naked. So how many are interested in going on a missions trip with the Apostle Paul? I mean, it's just like, it's the bad news bears. This is not good. It seems like everything is difficult. And there are some people who, who think two thoughts on this that are troubling. And the first is, if I follow Christ, I will never have problems. And we know from the Apostle Paul and Jesus and every follower of Christ, that's not true. But the second thing is, is if I follow Christ, I will only have problems. God does not lead us to suffering. God leads us through suffering. The goal is not the pain. The goal is the purpose that he has for our lives. And you should know that God is unafraid of any test, trial, or storm you will ever have to endure. He does not abandon us in dark valleys where death casts its shadow or in fiery furnaces where it feels like we're not going to survive the heat that we are in or through storms that seem capable of overwhelming us. God is relentlessly committed. No matter what you go through, you will go through because he will be with you every single step of the way. Some people think spirituality is just finding a way so that life is always easy. We're not looking for easy. We're looking for truth. We're looking for purpose. We're looking for what God has for our lives. And so we have to face down this idea that if I follow God's guidance, everything will always be easy. That's a myth. Here's another myth. God's guidance is limited to the spiritual elites. Like you have to be the paid professional. You have to be somebody on television. You have to be somebody who's well-connected and very educated in terms of spiritual things. But Jesus did not say he, his voice is only heard by other spiritual shepherds. He said, my sheep, all of his sheep, know his voice. Now, sheep are not known to be the brightest of creatures, and yet they can still learn basic commands, and they can still learn their master's voice. In fact, I don't have a sheep, but I do have a Bichon. It looks a lot like a sheep, just a much smaller version of it. If you don't know that story, I was given that dog as a present on Father's Day. The dog my wife always wanted, I got on Father's Day. But that's another story, and I regress. So, uh, the how many, does anybody have a dog? Okay. Does, you, does your dog obey any commands? No? 
<laughs> well, my, my dog does obey some commands. If I say sit, she will sit. If I say lay down, she will lay down. If I say stay, she will stay. If I say up, she will get up on her back feet. If I say go to bed, she will run into her, uh, into, we have a little room for coats, and, and we, she has a little crate in there, and she'll go in there and she'll lay down. And we have used, to teach her these things, treats. And the treats we use are Cheerios. Turns out she loves Cheerios, and they're way cheaper than the treats they sell for dogs in other places. And so now, whenever I go into the pantry to get Cheerios for my breakfast, guess who's sitting right there? <laughs> and sometimes she'll start going through the commands just in case I'm going to give them. So she'll get up, and then she'll sit, and then she'll lay down, and she'll, she'll just keep doing things to try to get my attention. And in our family, she kind of favors me, or she fears me. I don't know which. But if I give her a command and someone else gives her a different command, usually she will listen to me. Usually. And uh, so she just kind of learned commands and learned my voice. And sheep do that, too. There's certain commands because shepherds lead them to where there, fields where there's safe food for them to eat and lead them to waters where there's safe water for them to drink. They deal with their diseases and things that uh, could be dangerous for them, and they keep them from predators and protect them. And so sheep learn two things. They learn certain commands, and they learn their shepherd's voice. And you can actually, in, in the world, there's still uh, incredibly large sheep herds, and you can, or flocks, and, and you can actually run two flocks counter and in between each other, and the sheep will always follow their own shepherd. They won't get confused about where they're supposed to go. Now, um, of course, little, little lambs, little baby sheep, they've not learned the commands or learned their shepherd's voice yet, but they do have an instinct to stay close to the flock. And so they benefit from those who do know. What Jesus wants us to know is that every single one of us can learn to discern his voice. It's a myth that God only speaks to the professionals or the elites. The third myth is that if you follow God's guidance, you won't ever have to make a decision for yourself. You just always ask him and he always tells you. So which school should I go to? In my case, it was the one that accepted me, but that's another story. <laughs> Some of you get accepted at lots of them, and that's good. So wh which, which house should I buy? Which car should I buy? And often, we assume that if we can hear God's voice, he's going to make all of our decisions for us. Well, as it turns out, you don't actually grow and mature if someone else is always making your decisions for you. Some people think that God's only goal is to create a group of people who are completely compliant to every command. And God is less after compliance than he is after your growth and maturity. And in order to grow and mature in life, you have to learn to access information and make some decisions for yourself. I mean, how many have adult children who are away from home? How many do not want them calling and asking you what they should have for breakfast? <laughs> you know, um, maybe, maybe this is an oversight on my part, but when I have breakfast in the morning, I actually don't ask God what I should eat. I thank him for what I'm eating. Or I ask forgiveness for what I'm eating. <laughs> but that's kind of how that goes. See, a lot of times parents focus only on obedience. They want their children to be compliant to their commands, but they never teach them to learn to discern. And here's what you should know. If your child only learns how to obey when they are away from you, they will obey the most confident voice in their life, and it will no longer be you. They have to learn to discern. And to learn to discern, you have to access information. You have to figure things out. You have to weigh the pros and the cons. And you have to assess it in light of your goals and your purpose in life. And so questions less sometimes are about what is right or what is wrong, and more about what is edifying or unedifying, or what is helpful or unhelpful. You can do things that are very legal and very uh, moral 
and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them, and you are wasting your time. They're actually distracting you from the purpose God has for your life. And so we have to get away from this myth that uh, if I follow the guidance of God, I never have to make a decision for myself. So God is committed to speaking to us, so the question becomes, well, how does this happen? And some people are afraid. If God starts speaking to me, am I going to start hearing voices? Is he going to ask me to do strange things, like stand on a street corner with a placard saying the world is about to end or something like that? And the answer is, of course, absolutely not. Uh, there are some ways that God does uh, guide us, and uh, God may give you an idea, just an idea to help someone. It is uh, the, the word we most often use for this concept around here is a prompting. You're just prompted to some action. And it can be something as simple as holding a door for someone. It can be something as simple as... Uh, assisting someone with their groceries. It's just the idea comes to your head. Now, we don't think that all ideas that come to our head are from God. But if there's an idea that comes to, about helping someone else, we think that God might be involved in that. And so our goal in that situation is to try to follow through. Um, there was a guy by the name of Philip in the New Testament, and his story is told in the book of Acts. And he was a leader in the local church, and the Holy Spirit had actually directed him to be on a certain road. So he went there, and while he's on this road, it's a really interesting thing. There was a guy who was going by him in a chariot. A chariot is how they used to travel back in those days, and this was a self-driving vehicle. The horse would just stay on the road, so he was able to actually read and drive at the same time. And he's reading a scroll, because back in those days they didn't have books or smart devices, so he's got a scroll, and he would just, uh, scrolls are kind of clever, you just roll one end out and one end up as you go along, and the scroll he's reading is actually the, the, from the prophet Isaiah. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go and stay near that chariot. Now, did he hear a voice? Well, the Bible doesn't say he heard a voice. I think all that occurred was he knew he was being obedient to God in his location, and now this prompting came, go stay near that chariot. So the guy's just kind of going along, and Philip's just kind of going along with him. And he notices what he's reading, and he asks this man, do you understand what the prophet is saying? And the guy said, I really don't. He seems to be talking about this leader who will suffer. And, and Philip begins to explain it's talking about Jesus. And we've just been through his resurrection, or his crucifixion and his resurrection. And he leads that person to a saving faith in Christ. And the person actually says, he, he heard about people being baptized. He said, could I be baptized too? And they just happened to be walking by where there was this little pond full of water. They said, well, there's some water. Let's baptize you right now. I want you to think about this. Right? The simple thought, the prompting, the idea, go stay near that chariot, wound up with a person being born into the family of God and went home to his, his hometown in Ethiopia and had an influence to raise up an entire church there. You never know what simple obedience to a simple prompting can do. You never know. So God may give you an idea to help someone. God may remind you of a portion of Scripture. God may remind you of a portion of Scripture. Um, I don't know how this works for you, but everyone's... Does anybody ever get a song stuck in your head that you can't get out of your head? And how many... It's always a spiritual song when that happens. No? Me either. And, and I don't know why this happens to me. I will just think of a, a song that has nothing to do with anything going on in my life. It's not like I just heard it. And uh, I, I remember one time... I walked into the, the living room where my in-laws were, and I was whistling. I was just whistling a song that popped into my head. And the song, <laughs> the song was Hail to the Chief. It's the song that the, is played when the president walks in the room. <laughs> Why? No idea. Absolutely no idea. And sometimes I'll just crack up because I'll catch myself humming or whistling, and I have no idea why that song popped into my head. Well, sometimes a portion of Scripture will come to your mind much the same way. 
And the question is, why would that scripture come to your mind at that time? And often, God wants to assure us or encourage us or confirm something in us or direct us or give us confidence in a situation. And it's astonishing how often just this passage of Scripture, in fact, we shouldn't be surprised by this because God's Word tells us in Psalm, the 119th chapter, that your Word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. It actually helps us to know the next steps we are to take. See, all of us, I won't say all, many of us only think about Scripture in terms of learning, but Jesus tells us it can also be helpful in terms of listening. Jesus would put it this way. It says in John 14, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit actually brings to our memory things that God has been written and spoken in God's Word. And this can be very helpful for us in discerning the guidance of God in our life. Now, God may also activate your conscience. God may activate your conscience. This is one of the ways that God speaks to us. And conscience is usually when some emotion is attached to some potential action. Emotion is attached to action. Let me give you an example of this. So maybe uh, you see a person who's struggling and you actually have a sense of sadness for them. And you, so you're prompted to help, but you actually feel bad or sad for them. Or maybe you're thinking about something you just said or did, and that action is connected to an emotion of sorrow. You feel badly about it. And then you think, I really should go back and apologize or, or try to make amends or fix that situation. Or you may feel responsible. You don't just think of something that needs to be done. You feel responsible for it. And here's what I want you to hear from me this morning. Of all the ways that God can speak to us, this is the one that can go wrong the easiest and the most often. And the reason is, if you have been raised in unhealthy or abusive environments, if you've been a victim of uh, violence against you in any of the ways that that can occur, Often our conscience is not healthy, and so we will feel guilty when we're not supposed to feel guilty. We will feel bad when we're not supposed to feel bad. We will feel obligated when we're not supposed to feel obligated. We will feel sorrow when we're not supposed to feel sorrow, and it takes a lot of healing before you will feel confident in trusting that God is speaking to, to you through your conscience. But I do believe that healing is possible. And I do believe that it is one of the ways that God speaks to us. And what I will tell you, almost all injustice in the world that is being dealt with starts when someone's conscience is pricked. There, there is an emotion that gets detached with an action, and they cannot sit still and let someone go and be taken advantage of or injustice be done against them. Just last week, we, we celebrated... Uh, uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr.'s uh, uh, holiday. And when you look through his speeches, how often it is saturated with Scripture and how often there is emotion where it's not just this is not legal or this is, is, is not appropriate. It's this is not right. There's this sense of injustice that's done. His conscience is being spoken to by God and he cannot be silent. He has to stand up and address those issues. And I'm so grateful that throughout our world, there are people who allow God to speak through their conscience, and they will stand up against the injustices of our world. It says in Matthew 9, it says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had, what's the next word? That's an emotion. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest. There's the, there's the action. We need to pray because we need more helpers. He had compassion. There's the emotion. Prayer is the action because people are harassed and they're being driven and they are exhausted. They need help. So God can use our conscience to speak to us. And God may give you a brief mental image. So uh, uh, let's try a little experiment this morning, all right? 
I'd like everybody to think for just a moment, just a moment. God, I don't want you to check out on me and, and then I lose you the rest of the day. But just for a moment on the perfect vacation spot for you. All right? Just where would the perfect vacation spot be for you? Okay. Now let me ask you a question. In anybody's perfect vacation spot, was it very snowy and cold? No? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? How many in your perfect vacation spot, you could imagine palm trees <laughs> and white sandy beaches, yes? Yeah. And so we have these, these images that come to our mind. So this is actually what I'm talking about. This is not going into a trance or, or, or not being able to, to do anything else or not being able to see anything else. It's just kind of a mental image that goes through your mind. And let me explain how, I, I can give you a couple of illustrations just in the last couple of weeks of how this has worked for me. And uh, so we, we were praying for uh, two parents who, uh, when they looked at the trajectory of their child, they were terrified at what could happen. They were very concerned about where this was going in their lives and what it would mean for this child's life. And to say that they were concerned is an understatement. They were terrified by this. And so as I went to prayer, I actually was not even with them when this occurred. Aren't you glad that prayer knows no geographical limitations? Since God can hear you wherever you are and God can do anything anywhere, prayer is unlimited in terms of geography. And so I just started to pray for this uh, couple, this father and mother. And as I was, it was it's an, kind of an odd thing, I'll admit it, but it's just, it's what I, I just had this brief mental image that lasted for between one and two seconds, okay? And in this image, what I saw was the husband and the wife, the father and mother, kind of sitting side by side, and they were looking at a screen on the wall, and it was like a big flat television screen, and what they were seeing was the future of their child, and it was terrifying them. And that, that's all it was, just that very brief image. And it lasted from about here to there. And like, I didn't get, I wasn't stunned, I wasn't weak afterwards, it was just, it's a kind of an image that flashed through my mind. And so in that moment, what I chose to do was to pray based on something that I just saw in my imagination. And so I prayed that I said, I got, God, I know these parents can only see horrible things that could happen in their child's life. Would you please help them to see some wonderful things that could happen in their child's life so that what they see in their mind will no longer terrify them? Okay? And they weren't even there. Like, there, there was nobody around. Just, it was just me. I called the parents the next day to see how they were doing, and I'm not making this up. I'm not exaggerating this. They started telling me about a future for their child that they were hopeful for that would be much different than what they were seeing, what they were imagining. Now, I can tell you what I didn't do. Oh, I saw that. God showed it to me. You know, when, please understand this. I know sometimes when people do that, they're trying to reinforce confidence that God is concerned. But what we usually wind up doing is informing everybody else how spiritual we think we are. Don't do that. God did what we asked him to do. Let's just thank him for it. Let's not try to take any credit for that. Does that make sense? So I told you about Will this morning. And like he's a rock star in recovery. It's unbelievable what's happening. So I was in Friday to see him in the hospital, and he was sitting there in his bed. He'd already been up walking three times that day. He was eating scrambled eggs and cantaloupe. <laughs> and it was just, just within a week, you know, this, this kid was on a heart-lung machine just a little over a week ago and completely paralyzed. It's just unbelievable. And so I, I talked to him for a few minutes, and then I said, I'm, I'm going to pray, and uh, I'll let you alone. And when I went to pray, I just had a brief mental image go through it. It went from here to there. That's all it was, just kind of a... And what I saw in just my imagination was him practicing soccer. Now, it was interesting because it was practice, not playing soccer. He was practicing. 
And so uh, in, in, when I went to pray for him, this is how I prayed. I said, Father, I know that there's some physical therapy things that are coming up for Will, and I know that that's going to be challenging and frustrating, and I know he's already very good at practicing for a sport he loves. Would you help him to see his physical therapy as practice? He's just going to get better and better. In Jesus' name, amen, and I was out the door. So, <laughs> yesterday, while I'm doing membership class here, I get a text message from his parents. And, like, I didn't tell them anything about the picture. That was, all my, that was it. That was my prayer. That was all. And they sent me a video. And he's in the hospital with a soccer ball, practicing, kicking the ball up against the wall. And he's practicing. He's practicing. God can give us pictures of what he hopes to do or what he wants to do or what could happen. And it will often feel like nothing more than just an imagination to us. But if you will pray that picture, it's astonishing what God can do. Does that make any sense? And then uh, last one is this. He may give you insight or understanding. Sometimes it's just like the light comes on. And suddenly you, you, you understand why something is happening, not just watch something happening. So um, you're, you're frustrated at somebody's behavior or their reaction to something. And then all of a sudden you have an insight and you go, oh, that's why they're doing that. That's what it is. And that insight, it's astonishing, that insight helps you to have different responses to them. Now you're not just reacting to their behavior. You're responding to something that you understand. And that response is always now more gracious and more helpful. And God can use all of these things. Now, here's what I want you to see this morning. God is committed to speaking to us. We need to be committed to listening. Jesus told those people who had gathered around him, I have already told you the answer to the question you are asking. But you don't believe me. Sometimes God is giving us information and we dismiss it because it's not what we want or the way we want it. And I believe that God can direct and guide our paths so that our life winds up becoming a blessing to those who are around us. Does this guarantee you have no challenging days? Absolutely not. But what it will guarantee is that no matter where you are and no matter what you're going through, you have a Heavenly Father who's committed to being with you and He has something to say to you. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, we are grateful that you do not give us the silent treatment. That you have not stopped speaking to us because you are angry with us. But in fact, you whisper to us. You do not shout, but you do whisper. And I ask that you would help all of us learn to trust those promptings. We know that not every thought we think is going to be from you. And we know that not everything we say is something that you've told us to say. But we do believe that there are moments in our lives and in our day when you will whisper something to us so that your grace becomes more real, your presence becomes more palpable, your promises become more certain, and your purpose becomes something we can see. I ask that you would help us learn to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning?